here we go. Um, by the way, um, okay, we're getting started again. I'd like to mention that um, we're archiving both audio and video of today's events. Thanks, the audio is being archived and will be available on the RAIN website. Thanks to our friends at Backmo Networks. And our video is being captured by radio's best friend, trademark 1978, Art Volo. So let's uh, give uh, both a group big hand and Art, thank you. Yeah. All your friends are here and we're glad you're, we're glad you're here with us. Keep us in, he's keeping us in yes. focus. But first we've got a panel discussion about uh, a thing that matters uh, maybe most in our business, uh, listeners. Um, it seems lately there's a new streaming service launching every week, and they all offer, in some sense, the same thing to listeners. Song recommendations, playlist building, curated or on-demand programming. So uh, our music panel this year is going to examine the landscape and discuss ways that a service can stand out in today's streaming marketplace. And here to moderate the panel is another longtime friend of Rain and Rain Summits, Ted Cohen. I mean, yay. Good morning. I get a free iPad. How's everybody doing? Mike, how are you? Michael, Mr. Fisher, you're doing good. Everybody back in. Come on and sit down. This should be fun. We're going to embarrass somebody. They don't know it yet. No, I'm kidding. Daryl's looking at me. How many of you have been to a panel that I've moderated before? And yet you come back. I don't understand it. Uh, so you know the rules. The rules are this gets very interactive. The idea is that we're having a conversation up here. We're sitting at lunch. You guys all happen to be at the next table. So it's no presentations, no slides, no overt pitches. I used to carry a squirt gun. I don't do it anymore. Uh, but if it gets really pitchy, it, we embarrass you. Uh, if you have questions, we're not going to wait till the end. Raise your hand, and I don't know if we have a mic in the audience. If we do, great. If not, I'm sure you're all radio people. Talk very loudly. So let's kick it off. How many of you saw the presentation uh, that uh, helped me with it? No, before, after, the radio, the radio apps. James, the, the, James's presentation on radio station apps. Okay. How many of you thought radio station apps were actually more interesting than streaming music services? I did. So the challenge right now is, <laughs> my good friend Anthony. Uh, the challenge is this. Everybody's got 15, what's the number these days? 20 million songs, Anthony? What's the latest number that's in your library? 20 million? 20, 25. 25 million, whatever. It's 25 million songs. Everybody has 25 million songs. How do we make it interesting? What makes any of this stand out? And as you are challenged by things like iHeartRadio and some of the apps that we saw earlier today in his presentation, how do you get people to tune in? Because that's what you're doing now. So uh, I'm gonna kick it off with Daryl Valentine, but what I want to do is have everybody, so get ready, starting on the far end, uh, everybody introduce themselves for a moment, and what's your favorite app that's not a music app at the moment? Um, Start with your, who you are and where you're from and what you do. Okay, I'm uh, Thierry Ascares from Radio Nami. Um, my favorite app at the moment, um, good one. Um, new one I'm using is Swell, actually. Okay, cool. Mike? Uh, Mike Novak. I'm the president and CEO of K11 Air One Radio Networks. And admittedly, and please don't get mad, my favorite app right now is one we're developing called My K11. It's a social app. What's an app you have nothing to do with that you really like? Um, I, think I, I think I'm a news junkie, so Fox News. Okay. Peter. And I'm uh, Peter Burke Stephenson. I'm the founder and CEO of Mood Agent. And um, my favorite app. I mean, the one I use most is actually IMDb. Cool. Um, Daryl Ballantyne from Lyric Find. Uh, my favorite app is probably Waze. Um, yeah. When I'm stuck in traffic. I'm David Porter. I'm the CEO and founder of Atrax. And I'd say probably either Instagram or if I don't want to incriminate myself, uh, Tinder. <gasps> Ooh. Okay. <laughs> And last but certainly not uh, least. Anthony Bay, I'm the CEO of RDO, and um, I'm going to sound terribly mundane, but um, a weather site, which is the Norwegian weather site, yr.no. And if you want the best weather in the world, go to use that app. 
It's remarkable. It gives you better weather? It actually That's gives good. you accurate weather oh, accurate. Um, over a long period of time. And how the Norwegians managed to do that, I don't know. But they don't have much else to do there, I don't think. It's a much longer discussion, Ted. It's that and make herring. Um, well, that was terrible. Uh, I'm Ted Cohen. I run a digital media uh, consultancy. This is my 32nd year working on digital. We sat in a room at Warner Records in 82 and said, personal computer might have an effect on the entertainment industry, so we started noodling with it. And so uh, I'd say in the last three years, we finally got to what we talked about in 82. It's starting to get fun. My favorite app is a new app. Has anybody heard of Will Call? Will Call is Uber for nightlife. So it's uh, the same way that you can call a car with Uber and get picked up and never see the bill until your credit card goes out of control. Um, Will Call sets up a bar tab for you in a bar, you have to worry about that you, three in the morning, you remember you left your credit card at the front bar. We'll call, huh? we'll call out of San Francisco, backed by the guys from Uber and backed by uh, Sean Parker. They used to do something different though, like we'll call when it first launched was like ticketing, like events yeah, for that it's, night. Yeah, Does, it's isn't there also a thrill call? No, How's thrill that call different? is suing each other, one embezzled yeah. the money from the other and now the thrill is the lawsuit. So, and the calls are from the attorneys. So thrill call's gone, I think. So let's jump into it, and Daryl, actually, you're not going to go first. Peter, you've been noodling at this for a long time, and you've looked at all the services. How do, how do we, with as many tracks and as many people that are looking at this, and with the introduction of Beats in the last few months, how does anybody differentiate themselves? Why would you be a Beats person versus an RDO person versus a Spotify subscriber? Uh, I wouldn't know. Uh, um, I think they are very similar, all of them. Um, but I think they are moving out of it. Uh, they were, a lot of them were like spreadsheets in the, in the beginning. And um, I think, I actually think Beats is doing an interesting job at adding a layer on top of it to, uh, to guide you to something that fits the occasion or your mood or whatever it is. So I think that is moving us from the first generation and into the second generation. Uh, David? Well, I think one of the things that's been a bit confusing in the press is the sort of commingling of services that are fundamentally on demand versus services that are radio, because they're very different value propositions. Okay. On demand is typically, you know, I want to hear this song, this album, this artist, and I can tune in and, and instead of tuning in on, on iTunes. Uh, radio is a whole different experience, and it's, you know, tuning in passively to, to a category of music that I'm interested in. So I think that's something that's been, you see a lot of uh, articles that are comparing Pandora and Spotify and putting them in the same bucket, and they're, they're quite a bit different. But when you have Spotify and you have Spotify radio or you have Beats radio or if you, already, you have radio service inside of RDO, correct? You can go from a passive back, lean back experience to a lean forward experience pretty easily. You, you can, but I think, I think David's point is a very good one, which is um, essentially the, the on-demand part of a service like ours is an alternative to ownership, mm -hmm. um, and it is it works essentially like having everything on iTunes for a flat fee, and you you can collect and organize. And then the question is, how good are you at that? The same way people used different apps originally um, to manage their music, and then you have radio, and whether it's radio in the sense of Pandora or radio in the sense of playlists, um, it is essentially a programmed experience, and it could and so. And programmed experiences um, tend to be driven more by whether you like how it's programmed, right. whether you like the, the playlist someone has. And, and again, we and Spotify and others have both of those mixed in, mm -hmm. but the experiences, the experiences are very different. And so I think treating it like a single bucket is, um, you know, it probably misses the point. And it's interesting because I think a lot of the on-demand services have been seeking to differentiate by incorporating basically radio functionality. Yeah. Because if, it's, if you just have a spreadsheet of music, it's not that interesting if you can't find the stuff that's most relevant for your taste. And that's what radio is sort of set up to do. Mike, you're a radio guy. Are they, uh, how are they doing? When the services came along, it is a spreadsheet. I mean, they weren't programming. Now they're, now they're trying to program. Are they getting there? Well, it's something that we had to be aware of, obviously, and we, and we began to look into it and began to experiment with it and, and, and accepted it with open arms. Um, in our particular case, and that's my concern at this point, um, it didn't seem to do much to us. Um, when you have 
a vast number of listeners, the network is, is blessed to have pretty substantial cum. Um, you also have that same number who are willing to tell you anything. All you have to do is ask them. And this particular audience that we, that we go to, um, we began to listen to them and, and take verbatims back from them about what they liked and didn't like about the various different platforms and venues and tried to find the things that they liked and build them into ours if we could. And while acknowledging that there would be, there would not be, I should say, any more one way. It would be multiple doors into the same philosophy. Uh, so we try and embrace as many of those across the platform as we can. What were some of the biggest dislikes that you ran into, without naming a service, but I mean, what were people's complaints about subscription? They got bored with it. Because? Uh, it took too much work. Uh, I don't have time for it. I'd rather just turn this on and listen to it. Um, you began to see the difference between the extreme early adopters and where we sit, which is basically in the middle of the people, like, oh, well, I've got no choice. I'll go ahead and do it. Um, we don't really, in our case, and it's just our case, we don't worry about that leading edge. Um, they're not going to go there. Uh, and it, it was more, I don't think the average person that listens to our networks, even Air One, which traditionally is a much younger, um, mm -hmm. a little more uh, adventurous group, they got into it, but their words, not ours, their words, they, they got bored with it quickly. Hmm. I was, I've wondered lately, do we care more about music than the people we're serving? Are we more focused on this really amazing music experience where you, most people are actually happy with Pandora to let it run in yeah. the background and it just provides a soundtrack and they really don't want to work at it at so all. It's 80%, For, right? 80% of music listening is radio at this point. And it's yeah. still the number one way people discover new music, which surprised me. I it really I, did. I thought it would be split amongst people and it really wasn't. I, th I think a lot of the services now are designed and priced for the people who build them, not the people who should be using them. Uh, Ooh, elaborate. Good point. Well, I mean, you look at the the people, early, especially earlier on, the services were just a directory of music, which was great for the hardcore music people because everything was there. But that's not a mass market mm. product. And you look at something that's priced at $10 a month. That's not a mass market price. Why is that not okay, a mass wait, market okay. price? If you're paying 200 bucks a month for cable, why is 10 bucks for music? Yeah, exactly. So Netflix must not be a mass market phenomenon because it's just a list of a bunch of videos that you can watch, and who would pay you know, $9 a month for something But if, you, like if you look at the consumption patterns of what people spend on music, yes. the average person, the average in, in history was $64 a year. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to get people to pay twice that, you're restricting your market to such a small number of people. But is it a bad analysis of data if you're saying that people are only willing to spend $64 a right. year because they only found certain but things that think, resonated wait, that they were so willing to pay 12 bucks a crack for? But when you, when you use the, when, but when you phones. use like any of those examples, particularly cable, when cable TV first came out, mm -hmm. you weren't paying $200 a month. You were paying $20 a month or whatever, right? Maybe in Canada, but you only had one channel. But it was really good. We had beavers and yeah. all sorts of, yeah. um, and then gradually the price was increased over time. We can do the same thing with music by pricing it at $4 a month, and then in 10 years, it can be up to $10 a month, but you'll have 100 times more people paying for it because you're getting them hooked. Do you, did you see that segmentation? I think it was referenced in Paul Amir's speech at South By. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it was something that someone had done some research on a few years back. But it was basically this notion of there's 10% that are savants that spend $1,000 per year. There's another 20% that were sort of the engaged enthusiasts right. that spend up of, upwards of maybe 100 bucks per year. And then there was the, I think it was called the casuals, that was the next 30% that spent $10 a year. And then the final 40% was the, the indifferent folks who spend zero. Mm -hmm. So I think the, you know, the on-demand subscription services are really competing for those first two buckets to a large extent. How important, though, is things like what Beats is doing right now with the AT&T bundling? So you get it into your bill, and I mean, I've had it's Google huge. Play in my bill for a year and a half. If it's, it's invisible, there. I think it's huge, and that's, I think, uh, probably the best example of that to date has been uh, Deezer with their uh, bundling in France, where it's not even an add-on fee, it just comes with the set fee for your mobile service, and that they have huge distribution as a result. It's the same, the same that happened in Sweden in with, uh, with yeah, Spotify. Spotify yeah. it, was, uh, it was part of uh, your, your subscription. Was it part of Telus? Yeah. Or, uh... It was part of the device and the subscription, and you didn't have to pay for it. 
until 15 months down the line, and then suddenly you did. it was there. Yeah. And then you were hooked. Yeah, exactly. That's the point. Right. You, get it, you got in at a low price point, and then you raised the price. Actually, you bought it at zero. Yeah, that's okay, a pretty so low the, price point. Right, yeah. but the, the, you know, the premise you, you said earlier was if it was only $4, well, you but look there's at, a zero factor, which Spotify has led with zero for a long for sure. time. For sure, but then, they're, they're, then the first taste is always free, right, to get people hooked on the crack. Um, I thought it was the Hickory Farms model. Is that the correct model? I'm sorry. Oh, same thing. Okay. But if you look at like the Beats family plan with AT and T, it's 15 bucks a month for five accounts. That th that's three dollars a month per right. account, right? Maybe you're not going to use all five, but you know that's that's an accessible price point for people to get them in. But we sit and argue about the price of music over a five dollar yeah. cup of Starbucks. Right. Oh, and I'm it, not saying yeah. logically it makes sense that people value music that low. But that's the reality. That's what the number. Or they'll go to a club Sorry. over here to yeah. dance at Pure and spend fifty bucks a head to get in. They'll spend fifty bucks on a drink. But that's for the experience. In this case, if you're, you know, you're good point. You're so let's talk about experience. Right. right. So I mean, it's not. But I mean, the you know, your your desire, your unwillingness to spend three dollars a month or four dollars a month is because you can go to YouTube and listen for free. Or but you, you have to work to, at that too. You do have to work at that, but things like Pandora and A-Tracks that are sufficiently personalized, not for everyone, but for a certain segment, that's, an, that's good enough. That's, they don't, they don't necessarily enough. need yeah. to hear a specific song or specific album. They're just quite happy listening to a, a program of music that's aligned with their tastes. That, but that's always been true. I mean, that's true of regular radio you know, back in the day. Yeah. Which is why your distinction about radio, or, I mean, on-demand is an alternative. On-demand is renting instead of owning. Right? And music has never, other than Japan, had a rental category. Right. And so there's an interesting question of how much you pay to rent a big catalog versus buy. It may or may not correlate to the same spend. You don't know. But renting never existed. So renting, which is what a subscription service is, is a new phenomenon in music. Radio, which is, you know, again, I, I would argue what you guys do is, is a variation of radio. It's, it's not programmed with an algorithm. It's, you know, it's generated by curated. other people. It's curated. So, and you're right, for the most part, people are used to that being free and ad supported. And some people will pay a little bit to get rid of ads. But, but to, you know, but there's, for people, instance, Pandora. People, list, people, people will steal in many cases in order to listen to music. If you go around, you know, people, people will make mixtapes. Now you can do USBs. It's so people do like to listen to specific music. Absolutely. It's not a niche. It may be a question of how much people will pay for it. All right. And so there's a question of how much greater than zero, you know, you'd pay. But, but, People, people like both. It's not one or the other. And there's this other thing that's kind of a subtle point, which is I think for certain people, because they've downloaded most of the music that they've loved, either for free or on iTunes over the last 15 years, mm -hmm. they have most of the music they want anyway. So do they, they, it's almost like, do I really want to spend 15 bucks a month or 10 bucks a month just for those extra few tracks that I might want to buy otherwise in a given month or quarter? But I mean, isn't it an issue of, of quality? I mean, you said it. I mean, people... Um, if, if, if there's too much fuss in setting it up, and if you're not getting the right recommendations and all mm -hmm. that, then of course you don't want to pay a bundle for it. But I mean, but it's, you're paying for the cure. I mean, I think people are willing to pay for the curation. I don't think they're willing to pay for 15 million tracks. Right. There it's is the, the service around it. There is the quality of the content, but also the quality of the experience. So the quality of content, a good MP3 is not the same as what you've downloaded could be a crappy version of MP3 on Spotify, Beats, or audio. You're sure it's good quality. And then the quality of experience is, is finding it quite easily on a, on a platform, having recommendations, having playlists, created playlists. I think that that's why this platform exists today. Otherwise, they won't have existed. You go on, you can download for free uh, with a torrent or on YouTube, but the experience is not the same at all. But Jerry, why don't you tell us a little bit about Radionomy, what Radionomy is up to? Um, radio is, is, it's, so Radionomy is definitely radio. It's not on demand, so it's the lean back experience we were talking about. And we're providing the tools for semi-pro broadcasters cr to create their own radio station, and then we don't have exclusivity. Our content is everywhere on the web, so we're working with all the aggregators. But it's definitely, on a listener perspective, it's definitely the lean back experience, curated radio stations. How important are, is, has, are, have devices like Sonos, and there's others for us, and there's a few other brands that are doing home networking of, of audio, the, the Sonos experience. How important has that been, Anthony, to what RDO has done? David, you've had some experience with them. How many people here listen to music at home? 
Okay, so the answer is it's it's everybody. So it's, how many people here have Sonos in their home? We're a, right, we're of a the hands that are uh, of, of the people who own Sonos, is there anyone who's unhappy with it? Why? It's the clo the closed uh, the closed network. Right. Yeah, that's their big that's the biggest Achilles heel is the closed network, and there's others. But they they'll fix that. I mean, the, the, well, the question they, you asked though was, is a connected home audio system important? And the answer is yes. Okay. It's it's the it's how you listen to music in a big part of your life. Right. And in a car, it's it's important for the same reason. So that's one of the reasons that these services are growing as rapidly as they are is. It's getting easier, back to your experience point of view, it's getting easier and easier to listen to digital music, whether it's a radio experience or whether it's a, you know, you call it an on-demand experience, whether it's a, you know, song-driven experience. Mm -hmm. these, these partners are key. These are the distribution partner. You need them to distribute the content. So at home, in the car, um, mobile aggregators, all these people are very important when you create content. You need them. It's the distribution channels. Mike? You know, I, I have a question, and, and it is to, to something that we see across the entire enterprise. Um, there is a difference between the people that listen to us on our terrestrial stations and, uh, and the people listen to us through our apps, for instance, um, and, and when we tie into iTunes and iHeart and that kind of a thing. And, and the difference is this, that one is a very interactive, person-driven playing the music and doing everything around it. The other is pretty much just a music-only service. Um, the one question we, we struggle with as being broadcasters is, where is that going? Where is that going in the sense of how important is it to have someone, for the lack of a better way to say it, between the songs, or something between the songs that enhances your experience instead of it just being a song. I, well, that, okay, that, well, I have 800 anecdotes, so I'll throw that, this one that, in. I was listening to Sp Sonos. Uh, I was listening to Spotify. Sorry, Anthony. But I was listening to Spotify, and I clicked on Armin Van Buren. And I thought I was clicking on an Armin Van Buren playlist. It wasn't. It's a radio show that he does out of Europe. And it was him talking about the music that he liked and who huh. these artists were and what they did and where they came from and who they used to work with. It was a... 100%, 1,000% better experience than listening to a playlist of music that he, quote, picked. This was really him saying, this is why it matters. And similar to that, if you look at uh, Slacker, they've got all sorts of channels, and they started adding in actual DJs into some of the channels just to see what the response was, and it was extremely good. Uh, they, they became their most listened to channels and they got a ton of positive feedback on it. So I think having that, that layer in there definitely creates But you still have that choice. Experience. Some people don't want it. I mean, some people are like, I just yeah. want a song, you know? Yeah, I mean, they have a variety of channels, but yeah. Might be nice to have a toggle or something. Yeah. Um, I say, but it's kind of a... It's Switch between some, people. Like, that's right. I like this person, but not that person. <laughs> It's kind of like, in a way, if you think of, uh, one of the things I, I do think is kind of cool about mm -hmm. Pandora, sorry, right. is um, it, it tells you why a track is showing up, what, what attributes of the track make it, you know, added to your, why it was added to your playlist. So I think in the same way, you know, on our service, we don't have any um, sort of context from the DJ about why he picked a particular track. Um, we do allow DJs to add kind of text-based annotations, but I could see longer term there being maybe some kind of toggle or, you know, every half hour, there's some sort of introduction to the music that's about to be played to give the listener some context. I think that would be very compelling. You know, this question, we had a conversation it was at the cocktail party last night, and I was talking to Rocky, and we are talking about the thing that I noticed when I was at EMI that the company had a problem with was not so much how does digital work, was how do we market to digital? So the question is, how do you, uh, with Atrex or, or RDO, or Mike, how do you work now with labels who are saying, okay, if, if ownership is being replaced by access, then we have to increase the number of plays, we have to increase the awareness of the artist because we may have a 360 deal with them. And I think they're befuddled as a, as a group of, how do I market to you? How do I work with your with K-Love or how do I work with 8-Tracks or RDO when an artist starts to take off to maximize that opportunity? Because we knew how to do that with radio and we knew how to do that with Tower Records. Right. It's really hard to do with iTunes and with streaming services. It is, and you are spot on about that. That is a, a major concern with all the labels that we deal with and the heads of labels. Um, 
combined with the with the new platforms that are coming out, they also labels in general, as you all know, they're they're having a hard time making ends meet anymore. Um, at first, it was the the big thing of everybody stealing everything. Well, that's proven to not to necessarily to be the case. Um, I was just at Capital with EMI recently in Nashville, and one of the things they told us is their own data shows that the digital download market has flattened out mm -hmm. and in most cases started to drop. Right. They think what they've done is they've saturated that marketplace. So what do they do about it? Well, in our case, what we do is we try and just work with them and create, goes back to what we were talking about, an experience. We get beyond the music. We try and grab what would the person using this wanting to hear this artist, what, what would they want to do to get close to that person, wherever they are, why they wrote the song, that kind of thing. Um, it, it really isn't rocket science. It's just creating something that they can't buy. But you are absolutely correct. All of the labels in our particular genre are struggling with this right now. What do we do about the services that are out there that want pure just music downloads? That audience appears to be saturated. Do we dig and mine for more of them? Do we go back to producing typical albums, if you will? But how do they work with you when, when, you're, when you have artists that you're featuring? Either um, um, We're pretty stinking blessed. They kind of work with us and do what we want. Okay. What we like to have artists or labels do is create, um, create playlists, logically. So an artist may have a new album coming out, and they'll include two of the new tracks from that album uh, in a playlist along with other influences and favorites that were you know, important in, in, in that particular work. And the whole thing is, is just, you know, we can promote it on our end. And it's just a nice way that the artist or the label can take advantage of our platform. And another kind of twist on it is that we can take any playlist on the network and we can and sort of capture it in a, in a 300 by 250 embed player. Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. embed can be run itself as an ad on the network or off-site. Anthony? The major difference <coughs> with uh, streaming, streaming services and downloads are um, artists get paid when people listen in a, st in a streaming service, not when people buy. And so radio continues to be important and will be for a long time, whether it's radio from a tower or whether it's radio you know, over, it's still radio. You know, people get, I think, wrapped up in the, in the physical part of it, but programmed radio is proving to be very important, as we just talked about here. You know, if you will, I think radio has a great future if it can not think of itself as a tower um, and a little box. And so then the challenge you have is you can only play so many songs and you can only have so many artists. And so um, you promote differently. You know, how you promote on a service like ours with labels and, and artists is you have the ability for someone when they discover something new to go back and listen to everything the artist has ever done. And so a lot of it is a new record coming out, a new song coming out will be, you want to promote that, right. um, but they also want to promote the artist as a brand. And you can do that in a service like ours that you can't do otherwise. So again, these things are all additive. The bottom line is people are listening to more music. It's the same impact that Netflix had on the video business. People watch more video. And so either, I don't, you know, I don't think there's a lot of either ours. It's, how do you use radio plus a subscription service like us? How do you use radio? So what would be, but what would be a marketing campaign that would make the listener aware that Lord, when Lord was breaking, when Royals was breaking, mm -hmm. that this is something to be reckoned with other than social media, friends telling friends, you gotta hear this song. Well, we will um, do social media. We, we do artist campaigns. Um, mm -hmm. We do promotional campaigns with labels and artists to promote the artist um, on their social media or on ours and the new link to their music. So when, when they hear the artist on the radio, so it tends to be a combination of things. They'll be promoting the artist someplace else, but you can discover the artist more on a service like ours. So we'll use our, our social media, we do artists to watch, we do promotion of specific artists. So we part, part of a campaign, again, just like you yeah. said. Yeah, you know, taking it up a notch, it's interesting to start thinking about those of us who have gray hair and remember radio and a little more of a, a heyday, people couldn't wait for the new Beatles song. They couldn't wait mm -hmm. for the new Rolling Stones song. People nowadays can wait for anybody. You know, one of the things that the labels are dealing with, I can tell you this is top priority for them, is developing people that the, the general listening public actually wants to hear. We're flooded with one-hit wonders right now. 
Um, on the flip side, that was also the R and D. It's the first thing they cut out, as you right. know. Right. So they're kind of going, "Gee, we cut out all the, all the development of these people. Now we've got these half baked people. What are we going to do?" And our our philosophy is put it back into your product. You develop great product, and they'll sit and tell you, "Our job for you, all of us collectively, is to give you great product." And I can tell you, they don't think they are right now. So I go, you know, we we can talk about the nuances. But I go back to what are people, where's the importance of music in people's lives today? It's totally different than it was 15, 20 years ago. And part of it may be just the time we're in, part of it may be the billion other distractions that we have in the world today. Part of it may be that if you listen to some older, you know, 60s and 70s, some of that stuff was just kind of fun. Mm -hmm. There isn't any fun music now. It's all kind of serious. Gangnam Style wasn't fun? No. <laughs> I just bought his greatest hit album. It's really good. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, In general, uh, um, songs by Tiger. I, I, I think music is more important now than it was then because people have music with them everywhere right. now. It's not... Uh, That's the disconnect, though. The disconnect is music's more important and more accessible than it's ever been, yet it's still not valued. Yeah, yeah, that, because that, it, because that it doesn't, doesn't have to be to valued because there are options to get it for free. To, there are, it's easy yeah. to not pay for music. It's but easy radio to was free. But people. Yeah, I'm not even talking radio, about. Radio but, was free, but you had to wait for them to, wait. to play the right. song. Like mm -hmm. the, like you were talking really. about waiting for the, a specific song. I remember as a kid, I would sit by the radio hoping that they would play the song that I wanted to hear. That doesn't exist anymore. You don't have to wait. Well, you can hear Justin it. Bieber on demand, Daryl. We <laughs> deported him to you guys. And it, you, you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. An, a, yeah. Another yeah, model. loser kept Be Bieber. So, yeah. Well, that's all yours. <laughs> so, let me, Anthony, let me ask you, uh, and, and David, uh, Mike was very forthcoming about how they polled listeners and got feedback on what works and what doesn't work. Y you've been into this for about five months now? Four months. Okay. So, I mean, you're fully vested. Um, <laughs> what, have, what have you found in terms of feedback from RDO users as to what A needs to be tweaked and B, we're, we're roughly 90 days into beats. Has there been two things? Has there been any halo effect around streaming? So are people checking out RDO because they heard about beats because of the TV ads, etc.? And have you had to up your game in the last 90 days? That's a multiple, multiple choice question. Here we so go. Um, the Taking the thing up a bit, um, okay. the biggest challenge we have, you saw here, is that very few people on this panel think subscription music makes sense. Okay, that was the, why would people pay for this? Why would people pay $10? So I think the bigger challenge is the concept of having essentially all the music you want to listen to mm -hmm. and paying for that. If you, you know, if you will, Netflix for music, people got it with Netflix, but it took years. So that, I would say the number one thing, and so the more awareness there is, Beats is, you know, created more awareness. Right. Um, certainly, people write about it a lot. You know, the, the press loves the you know press loves the, the competition part of it. So, in general, um, that's true. On a global basis, you know, you take it depends by countries. You know, you talked about Sweden. I mean, in Sweden, it's you know a very high percentage of the population has um, a Spotify subscription. So, you know, it, it's totally correlated to where you are in the world. Um, and in terms of what people want, um, you know, I would say. Something Jeff Bezos said. He said, "You know, um, we've never had somebody tell us they want less selection. Please, Amazon, will you get rid of some stuff that's on Amazon?" What right. they say is, "I want to, I want to have it easier to find. I want to have it more personalized." But no one thinks great selection is a problem. And so, um, I think the same thing is true in music. It's just how do we make it accessible to people? And then, how do you also do, you know, again, a radio type experience? But have you, have you, I mean, one second, David. Have you, have you counter programmed at all in the last 90 days? Have you, is, is, is if they, counter programmed? If, to beats. I mean, if you looked at beats and said, okay, here's where we need to up our game, or here's where we need to just tweak the knobs a little bit. I think you do that every day, every minute of every day, not in relationship to beats, but in terms of what um, is, what your, what customers in general are interested in. So. Okay, David. Well, I was just going to say, I think you're right. I think the, People don't com ever complain about having too much selection. I think that's great, um, but what that, where that really, where the rubber really hits the road in terms of a better value proposition, is there's more specific or relevant content for a listener. So in our case, our biggest challenge is we now have you know a million, a million and a half, uh, painstakingly curated playlists 
Mm. But then how do you find the one that's right for you? So what we've begun to realize is that while we've long prided ourselves on being this sort of handcrafted, soulful David to the algorithmic Goliath that is Pandora, we also have to get clever about the algorithm so we can help direct listeners to that playlist that's right for him or her. Daryl, how important are lyrics these days? I mean, that's your life, but I mean, this has been an They're really important to me. They're really important to you. I'd be out of a job. Um, well, lyrics have always been the most searched for content online uh, as a, as a search term. Before or term. after sex? As a, well, it's, it's a more popular search term than sex, but that's probably because there's 500 different ways to say sex and there's only one way to say lyrics. Uh, but uh, it's... Go in the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, just keep going. <laughs> I'm, I'm going okay. to move it yeah. back towards the, back to the lyric side of it. Right, uh, <laughs> but it, it, it's really highly sought after content, and we see that through uh, all the different services that we're powering. We see a lot of traffic going going through them, and we see increases in traffic uh, across the different services. And we're we're serving ourselves through all these different services over five billion lyrics a year right now. So. And that number is going up really quickly as we embed in more and more services. So there's an astronomical amount of, of traffic and demand for it. And a lot of different ways that, you, that it can be integrated to make the experience better. The synchronization that we're doing now is, is really creating a much better user experience uh, by having it there line by line in time with music rather than having to go to a separate lyric site or go to another page and have this giant blob of lyrics and have to actually move your eyes to follow along with. Are the rights owners, other than the revenue splits, are the rights owners getting smarter about looking at exploitation as opposed to trying to keep it precious? Yeah, for sure. We're seeing over the last couple of years, the, the publishers have been a, a lot more willing to experiment with different things, do different deal structures, and try to get things out there and and do it in a way just to grow the pie rather than focusing on what is the rate per display or what is the uh, wh what's the the dollar amount that we're getting for every little piece it's more about what's going to generate the most revenue overall and what's going to generate uh, uh, the best experience and on that note Peter so mood agent is about five years old now maybe six yeah. So what, what's been the lessons for you over the development from, I, me I remember seeing it the first time in Berlin five years ago. Um, well, I mean, the lessons, I mean, we, Mood Agent is an app that generates playlists off of the uh, tracks you have on your own device. And what we're seeing now- And is, services now. Yeah, and then we're moving into uh, doing the same, but for the streaming services. So we have an app inside Spotify that generates playlists from any track in Spotify. Uh, so what we're seeing is that people, I mean, I experienced this last night, people don't actually have music on their device anymore. Right. They, they expect the music to be online. Uh, so we're actually moving into providing our services to the music service providers and to the publishers and the labels and whatnot so that they have better metadata about their collections um, so that they can actually produce better experiences. and. Yeah, profile uses and pinpoint where the new releases fit into the user's taste and so on. So, yeah, I think more data is going to be, uh, and better data. And do you share be. that data? I mean, all of you, in the, with, with, the, with your partners, content partners, are you sharing use data, preference data, all that kind of, it seems to be very important. <laughs> the digital marketing people, that's all they talk about when I see them is getting their access on any data that tells them what people are doing. I keep pointing to you because yeah, you're the I'm I'm just on your left, I think. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to move. Um, you know, there's there's the challenge there where um, you have to balance privacy yeah. and... There is no privacy. Um, well, there are laws about privacy and, and <laughs> there is. Our, our own government can break them in this Tell country. Tell that to the NSA. You know, they can't actually do that in everybody else's country right. and get away with it. Um, but uh, that's a different discussion. So, you know, in, in certainly in Europe, privacy, you know, you're starting to see a bigger push for privacy. So there's a question of what you share and how you share it and mm -hmm. what's personal and what's not personal. But, um, but yeah. But agri aggregate anonymous consumer behavior data is, is... 
yeah, reasonable. I mean, so from a point of view of aggregate, and the, uh, the other question is back the other way. You know, the, the labels um, get the reporting from everyone. So they have aggregate data, and then just like consumer product manufacturers know across retailers. So the combination of sharing those things, I think, is going to be more and more important. Um, yeah, I mean, okay. why not? Mike? I was just going to say, we have uh, three or four streams we do through AccuRadio, mm -hmm. and we share stuff back and forth all the time. Okay. It only makes us both better. Okay. Terry, you, you yeah, because the, the, I think the model is different for radio and music. We're talking about, uh, about music here, but the radio is still remains different for us. The business model is advertising. It's not subscription. Mm -hmm. So you have to share data to advertise for advertisers. So um, I think it's important here also when we're the main goal of this panel is listener choice, but we are talking about a lot about music and the radio is a different approach. Um, on demand doesn't really exist with the radio. I mean, when you're talking about a curated programming like traditional radio station, you don't have subscriptions. It's no one's going to pay to have access to radio. The business model is advertising. No, but people said no one's. Um, two minutes? Oh, um, geez, I don't get any questions. We have two minutes. I thought we, I didn't know. Yes, as loud as you can. I'm uh, sorry. What? The, the the labels own data. The labels own data. iTunes is publicly saying that, yeah, that I, downloads are, yeah. are have now trended down. They were flat yeah. for two years and now they're on a downward swing. Right. It, it's not a third party. It's their own in iTunes, like Tim said. There was another question. Yes, you. Yes and no. I mean, I'll, I'll disagree with you. I'll, I'll, get, I'll throw my two cents in here, which I always do. Um, the great thing I loved about subscription was I thought that iTunes and the download services that had come before that, because there was Rio Port, there was Liquid Audio, there were services before iTunes, was that it made people think about what's the 99 cent purchase of the one track from an album that respectfully, I don't think artists went in the studio to come up with only one good song and 11 clunkers. So how do you find the next U2 if you're only buying one track at 99 cents? And so when, when subscription came along, the barrier to discovery went away. It was, you know, pay one price and I can listen to the entire new Imagine Dragons album, which happens to be a really good album. Even the Miley Cyrus album is actually a really good album. I'm sorry, but I think so. Uh, so I think that you can discover talent now through things like radio services and through subscription that, that Individual track downloads killed that for a long time. Yes, sir. Yeah, I just want to say that I remember when I was a kid, I would buy an album for one song, and then you would see the album over and over again, and that's radio. That's radio. <laughs> that's radio. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Right. Right. I think the earliest lesson we had that when I first got DMI, we did a deal with a company that was called Music Masters. Was it Music? Um, not ma no music masters. I, I'm not, I can't think of the name. But we gave them thirty thousand tracks, and they put kiosks out there to burn CDs. And they said thirty thousand tracks available. Pick ten. Nobody could pick ten. Then we did thirty thousand tracks. Here's some sample playlists, and you can swap a track out. Then people started using the service. There was way too many tracks there to try and think about what you want. Yes, Mike. Remember the iPod? Mm -hmm. I mean, they advertised it as nine thousand songs. Apple's own data said the average person downloaded less than 200, kept them on there for about six months, and then dropped it from there. I'll leave you with one story about piracy. I have a client that does video compression work, and he's been working on it for a long time, and now he's trying to get television and services to use it. And I said, who's your current client that, that you're making all your money from since you don't seem to have the big client? He goes, oh, it's the NSA. I said, great. How's it like working with the NSA? He takes his cell phone. And he pulls the battery out, and he goes, they're really great to work with. 
and they're great and so all of a sudden all of us are taking all our batteries out of our cell phones and someone walks into the meeting and there's five of us sitting there with phones taken apart what are you talking about or we're talking about the nsa on that note i'd like to thank the panelists and uh nothing we said here will leave the room everything already left the room too. exactly <laughs>